Chapter 12, Seminole Village. After we left the Brickell Post and headed up the river, we passed a bunch of long, low buildings on our right. One of them, I knew, was the Dade County Courthouse, where Papa had come to record Lily's birth certificate and the property deed for his extra land along the east side of Lake Worth. Back when these buildings were built during the Seminole Indian Wars, they were called Fort Dallas. It wasn't until later this area was renamed Miami. We sailed on until we heard a rush of water ahead. Soon, we could all see why Mrs. Brickell said we could never get the Magellan over the rapids. The river tumbled toward us, a bunch of small waterfalls, down a bunch of small waterfalls, one after the other, stretching for about 50 feet. No boat could possibly sail up those rapids. Tiger joined me at the tiller and said, That's Pa Hayuki. He pointed, he pointed at the water. It was clean and clear. I started to get excited. We were almost there. We found a small cove at the bottom of the rapids where we anchored the Magellan, and then we transferred our gear to the Falcon. It seemed like a pretty seaworthy little boat, and even loaded down with both Bradley Brothers and Lily, plus our gear, it didn't ride too low in the water. Tiger and I loaded more gear into his canoe, and we headed for the rapids. It was slow, hard work to gain the base of the rapids, then unload our, our gear, carry it along the rocky bank, and go back and carry the boats. Even with all five of us dragging the falcon, it still took the better part of the day, and we were all sweaty and tired by the time we got our vessels back into the water. But we were excited too, and even Louie, who had been complaining the whole time we carried the boats, hushed as we moved slowly up the river against the mild current. We were actually heading into the Everglades, and I wondered whether the others were thinking the same thing. I was. How many rookeries are hidden in there, and where is Samuelson's secret snowy egret rookery? But our search would have to wait, because it would be night soon, and we would need a place to camp. Just as I was beginning to look for a good campsite, Tiger said, Look, and pointed to thin columns of smoke rising into the sky from up ahead. What is it? I asked. Seminole Village, Tiger said. I had been in a Seminole Village before with Tiger, but none of the others had. Guy whistled softly as we rounded a bend and approached the village. The Indians wandered down to the riverbank to see who was approaching. The village was small, with thatched chicky huts sprinkled among more permanent structures made from wood. Two fires smoldered in stone fire pits, and a few little kids ran around the village playing. The Seminoles looked happy to see us until t looked unhappy to see us until Tiger waved with his paddle and yelled a greeting in the Seminole language. Then smiles split their faces and they invited us ashore to eat and spend the night. As I climbed from the boat, I noticed a tall, regal-looking Seminole watching us. He had light gray eyes and was one of the finest-looking Seminoles I had ever seen. Tiger whispered, "Jumper Osceola," in my ear. Jumper Osceola was supposed to be a descendant of Chief Osceola, the most famous of all the Seminoles. We pulled our boats on shore, and Tiger introduced everybody. The Seminoles welcomed him like family and were very kind to the rest of us. That night, the Seminoles prepared a feast of deer stuffed with vegetables and roasted over an open fire. They also served some kind of bread I'd never seen before. When I asked about it, a look was passed among the older men. One leaned forward and said, It's Conti Hatika. What's that? Lily asked around a, mouth, oh, around a mouthful of meat. I cringed, worried that the Seminoles wouldn't like being questioned by a young white girl with bad table manners. But the Seminoles just laughed. Lily and Bandit had been a big hit earlier. She had Bandit do tricks like climb up her arm, and the little kids laughed and shouted, Woodco! Woodco! Conti Hatika is seminal bread, Jumper Osceola said, made from special plant. <clears throat> then they explained that the Conti Hatika plant was the same plant white men called Kunti. The Seminoles used it to make bread by pounding the roots into a powder, then placing the powder into water and letting the starch sink to the bottom. They then used the starch to make bread. They said kunti plants used to cover all of South Florida until white men arrived. The white men 
used kunti plants to produce arrowroot, a starch we use in cooking. Once the white men discovered arrowroot, they dug up and killed almost all the kunti plants. And since it took 30 years for a single plant to reach maturity, there were no more young kunti plants to replace them. Now only kanti hatika left is the kanti hatika deep in Peheoki, Jumper said, where white man can't find it. That's awful, Lily said, and she looked as if she meant it. But I didn't know exactly what I felt about the Kunti story. On one hand, I felt a little guilty that my people had used up all the Kunti plants. But I also knew that my mama and Ma Bradley used arrowroot to make biscuits and cakes and other things I liked. It was a little confusing, to be honest. After dinner, Jumper asked us why we were sailing up the Miami River in the Falcon. Tiger answered in Seminole, and Jumper frowned. And then he said something to Tiger, and Tiger listened, but he looked at the ground. After Jumper was done speaking, I asked Tiger to tell me what Jumper had said. Tiger looked pretty miserable as he said, Jumper, Osceola, and Seminoles know the falcon. White man sailed through here last month. He was plume hunter too. Jumper, Osceola, said boat was full of bird feathers, but bird meat and bones were left to rot in Paheoki. He said... The tiger stopped and looked embarrassed. What? I asked. What did he say? He said Seminole stopped hunting for plume birds, and no Seminole should hunt for plumes. He said my grandfather was proud warrior, but he is ashamed now that I am doing white man things. I knew just what Tiger was talking about, and once again I pictured that big pile of bird carcasses and remembered Papa saying that plume hunting was a lousy way to make money. But on the other hand, I also knew that we weren't the only plume hunters around, and the Seminoles didn't really understand money like we did. How could they be expected to understand that we needed money so we wouldn't have to sell our island? They didn't have any private land. While all this was going through my head, Guy said, But aren't there millions of birds? I've heard there are so many birds that sometimes they fill the whole sky. There's no way all those birds would disappear. Tiger shook his head. Jumper Osceola said there were many Kunti, too, and now there are few. He said that once white men starts to take, he takes until everything is gone. I looked over at Jumper Osceola and the other Seminoles. They were watching us with hard expressions. I wanted to explain to them about Papa's land, but I knew they wouldn't understand. Instead, Tiger just looked miserable, and we went back to eating and didn't say much. We slept in a chicky hut that night. Seminole chicky huts have thatched roofs and no walls. Their floors are raised off the ground so that no alligators or snakes can get in. Guy and Louie and I tried to make Tiger feel better, but he looked depressed and didn't say much. Even Lily couldn't cheer him up with Bandit's tricks, including a new trick where she got Bandit to hide in her shirt collar and peek around her neck. I didn't know exactly what to say, because I felt as if I understood Tiger a little better than my friends did. After all, Tiger and I had been friends since we were little boys. I knew that Tiger was a proud Seminole, but I also knew that he understood why we were plume hunting. That was the first time in my life I realized how hard it would be to live between two cultures like Tiger was doing. He was Seminole, but I also knew he was proud of his friendship with me. It was a long night that night, especially with Guy and Louie coughing and waking us up. That medicine I brought from the Brickell trading post didn't seem to be working. I guess Guy and Louie must have been keeping the whole village awake because the next morning a very old Seminole came to the chicky hut while we were getting ready to leave. He was wearing feathers and bones and carried a small bag that he pushed at Guy and Louie. They looked pretty nervous, but Tiger said, it's Seminole medicine. I don't know, Guy said uncertainly. Ma wouldn't want us taking anything like that. Just then, he started coughing again, and Tiger said, Looks like your medicine not working. Try. So they boiled up a foul-smelling tea from the leaves and roots in the bag and drank it. Personally, I was glad I wasn't sick and didn't have to drink the stuff, but I hoped it worked. After they finished with the seminal medicine, and we ate a quick breakfast, we prepared to leave. At the last minute, Jumper Osceola came down to the riverbank and said we couldn't take the falcon that deep into Pahioki. Instead, he loaned us a big dugout canoe made from a hollowed-out cypress tree. 
I was surprised Jumper would help us after last night, but we were grateful for every bit of help we could get.